Hello everyone, I hope you're all having a great evening. My name is Dennis and I'm a software developer at Domanda. I work on the front end and we at Domanda use Relay Modern to make really powerful data-driven front end apps. I'm very excited to be here at this meetup. This is my first talk and let's go right in. So the outline of the today's talk, we are first going to talk about GraphQL, what it is, what benefits does it provide over a standard REST API. Then we are going to go to data-driven views and talk about what makes a powerful and a featureful data-driven view. And then finally, we are going to talk about Relay Modern and how these two fields connect and form Relay Modern. So GraphQL, you're probably all familiar with it. How many of you have used it before? Nice, so everyone, it's really nice. And did you like it? Raise your hands if you liked using GraphQL over REST. Super nice. So let's just kick it off and say a GraphQL is a query language for your API. It focuses on the front end developer and its needs. You can actually specify precise data that you need for a specific view and GraphQL will handle all connections and bring you just that. You can, of course, also combine different data sources inside of GraphQL and make combinations of uh, data inside a single network request. It, of course, abstracts over any storage layer, so you can use in the back Postgres or My MySQL or any other database. The schema provides type saf safety because you define which types of nodes and its fields are inside of it. And by actually empowering the schema and commenting the code, you can generate a full-blown uh, documentation for your GraphQL endpoint. So let's just go quickly and see what the data graph inside a GraphQL looks like. Here, these circles that you see on the screen are basically nodes, and they are like laid out on the plane. They are globally ident identifiable by their ID. So the, the important thing is that the ID of a node can be unique for every single node and that you can get a specific node with its types and its fields just by providing that unique ID. You can, of course, link other nodes to nodes. So in this case, you have a user which has fields, email, and his full name. But you can also have fields about articles and link other nodes which point to different articles. This way you can change articles and it will of course reflect with nodes. I'll then continue with pagination. Uh, it's really important to understand that we need pagination since often we don't want to get the complete data set. We don't want to get millions of data and information if you have it. And connections actually connect a list of nodes to, to, uh, to you, essentially. So with, with a connection, in this case an article connection, you have inside of it a page information. This page info provides information like how many nodes are in total inside that connection, as well as uh, ending cursors and starting cursors. So cursors inside these article edges are basically identifiables of uh, the position of that exact node in the connection. So it's really important to use this cursor and you'll see why. Also, article edge is just a wrapper. It wraps the actual node, so it keeps the node clean of any other information, so the node shouldn't know about where it's being paginated or why. Let's compare uh, the two standard ways of doing uh, pagination. So offset-based pagination, as you already see, can have room for inconsistencies where nodes between pages might change or one node might be removed and then you go to the next page and you can see the same node before or you, you have duplicates. And with a cursor-based pagination, you can actually pinpoint the location from which you want to start the connection and uh, do the pagination. The thing what cursor does also good is that it holds also the order of the nodes. So if by any case some node have changed or it was removed or added, it would still point to the exact same node, but, uh, but, but yeah, no buts. So here we have side by side a standard REST request and a GraphQL request. On the left side you see a REST request. Here you see that you define what data type you want to get inside the URL. 
and you can pass additional parameters inside the body. The response is fixed, so the structure is predefined by the server before. And if you ever want to get more data from the response, you either need to modify the server to provide that data, or you would need to make n plus one requests for every single set here to fulfill your needs. On the other hand, if we take a look at the GraphQL, the endpoint tells you nothing except for the location of the GraphQL server. And inside the query parameter, you basically specify exactly what you need. And as a response, you get exactly what you've requested for. So let's go through some examples real quick. All right. So this is a data model and I use in the back Prisma. Have you heard of Prisma before? Has anyone? You did? Okay. What Prisma allows you is you just define the data model and it would construct the complete database in the back. So let's just go through our data model that we are going to use today. We see that we have a type of a type user and it has its IDs, it has an email, it has a full name and the links that I showed in the slide before. It can point to multiple art articles and it can point to multiple comments. The same thing for article. One article needs to have an author, it can have comments and the comments points to an article and to an author. The important thing that we need to watch is this exclamation mark. What the exclamation mark says is that you, this data is required to exist inside of this node. And this unique metadata says that through all the nodes, this is the unique part against it. So let's just pop and start this uh, Prisma. How, how did I start it? Just by using Docker Compose up. If we take a look at our uh, Prisma YAML, we basically expect it to use the data model that I showed now to have an endpoint under 4466 and to import the seed GraphQL. The seed GraphQL consists out of multiple mutations which, would ju which will just pre-fill the data inside the database. We'll leave that out for now. So now that it's up and running, we can have, we have now a Prisma playground. So let's just make a simple users query. Here, I am basically requesting all the users that exist in our database. And as you can see, I'm getting just their IDs. If I want more information about them, I can just add and construct the complete response data from the client itself. If I want to list all the articles that this user, that the user has written, I just join in the articles and, of course, again, uh, define which fields we want from those users. We can also have named queries. So if we name this query, we can easily identify it inside our server because it will have this operation name as a parameter. We can, of course, if we have, for example, some comments and we want to get some uh, ID and, some, and the author of that exact comment, we can again write all the connections that we need here, as well as the content, and we will get that data. As you can see here, we have some redundant uh, information that we are writing. So this ID together with this ID could be easily replaced. How does GraphQL solve that? It provides fragments. So you make a fragment, which is a user fragment, and it's on the field user. And here you can just say, I need on this fragment uh, ID, I need a full name, as well as uh, having an email inside of that. And then I just spread the fragment wherever I need it, and I get that data pre-filled. So we also can do mutations. Doing mutations is also rather simple. You just write mutation instead of a query, and then you perform any set of mutations, like update, update user, and then you select which user, user where ID is this one here, and then you can, of course, provide some other data which you would want to change. I would like to change his full name to uh, 
some something else. And then I take the reply. I can, of course, use the same fragment and spread the result of that reply. So we are having an input problem. So I face now a problem and I need to solve it. I don't want to navigate away from this view. By using the schema, I can open up and see all the possible queries and mutations that I can execute against this GraphQL endpoint. So I see here that I'm making this request incorrect, and that's simply because I didn't put it in other parentheses like this. And here we see the new mutated data response. So, so mutations are actually the same as queries, but they also provide the ability to mutate data. You can treat them exactly like that, and after the query has been performed, you basically retrieve that data that you've requested within the mutation itself. If we want to pa pass some arguments, like we want the user to identify which, we want the client to identify which user he wants to modify, we can pass the clients by writing a simple syntax inside the query, and then use the ID right here. And if I want to pass this ID here, I need to write it inside another field inside your request that you're making against the table, against the GraphQL. So coming back to our GraphQL examples. Just a quick question. The ID with ID. Yeah. This this ID here is a part of Prisma and it basically defines that this node is uniquely identifiable. And it must be it's different from having an ID or having a string like this. Why is it different? Because as I said on the uh, slide before, all nodes have to be uniquely identifiable and by defining this ID exclamation mark, you say that this ID is unique throughout the complete database. So basically, the data type is the same as string, but we find it as an ID. Exactly, exactly. Okay. So that you can easily uh, see what you're handling. Okay, so any questions? Of course. No, uh, she's not. So let's make a standard connection. So I'm making now a query and I want to get the articles connection, which I have here. We can also take a look at the schema of how it works. Here we have it, the articles connection. These are all the possible arguments that I can pass inside the connection, like uh, ordering or uh, displaying how many items I want to show and skipping or going before a certain edge or a certain cursor inside the GraphQL endpoint. And then if I do this and say just give me the first two users, uh, two articles, they are not wrapped, they are not immediately accessible here, but you see that we have edges now instead of just plain nodes. And that edge contains the cursor, as you can see here, as well as the node of the article that it's pointing to. So if we do this now, you can see basically that we have our connection and our reply and the edges for every single node inside the response, it contains a specific cursor. So if I say I want articles after this cursor, I can just write after and then put this here, and then you get articles after that cursor. Since we don't have any, you see just an empty set. You can also use before, and now I will get the article before this cursor, which was the one that you've seen before in the full set. What more can we provide? We can, of course, use more ordering, or we can just take the last, uh, the last X amount of nodes or edges inside of a connection. So that's how connections work. Okay, so any more questions about GraphQL or 
making requests. All right. Of course. You mean REST APIs and backend? Yeah, yeah I, I hope so. I can't say anything for certain. I just see the ability of you as a developer, as a front-end guy, to specify exactly what you need. And you don't need to pull the t-shirt of the backend guy or the database developer for asking changes in the mutations. So given the fact that you as the presenter of your product, you can just sit and decide which uh, fields you want to display inside of it, I think that's powerful enough for REST to be deprecated by GraphQL. Hmm? Yeah, no. Okay. Uh, of course. Uh, you have shown us this wonderful uh, language to, to state what, uh, queries. Yes. But what does the backend server have, has to provide? That's exactly it. So, the backend server can be anything. A GraphQL is not an application, it's just a specification of how you would communicate with a certain data source. <coughs> so what GraphQL did here is it actually communicated with the Postgres database which lived inside that Docker container that I started up before. And that Postgres database has a specific set of functions which do these requests that we have made, but GraphQL abstracts the data layer away from it and just gives you this specification where you just follow the rules and you get the data that you want. So in the back end, you can use virtually anything that you want. Yes, 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 it still does, it still does. So this is the API actually? This, this is the API, yeah. And you give it to a server and of course you have more uh, frameworks which wrap your server and provide you with helpers to constructing your server and having a proper GraphQL endpoint. So you have everything that you've seen here in the previous example, all the mappings are, you can define them in a server in the back and use them in, in use them without a storage layer, uh, regardless of what the storage layer is in the back. For example, we at Domanda use PostgreFile, and what PostgreFile does is it takes your Postgres schema and creates a GraphQL schema out of it. And then you just have that PostgreFile instance running, which communicates with Postgres, but you as a client communicate with PostgreFile and tell them, I want a connection of articles, give me edges, first 20 edges, of this and that, and then PostgreFile converts those to actual queries that it should make against Postgres. One, one, one mapping between Postgres and your Postgres schema. Excuse me? Why do you want a one-to-one -one relation between your Postgres or your database schema and your GraphQL, GraphQL schema? Well, I want to query Postgres uh, with data I want. So I don't want to make a REST call on Postgres and get all the information that I want in Postgres. I rather just form the view from GraphQL and just request that. And then PostgreFile will just take parts of the complete database and respond with that. It will make the network request smaller, it will make it more efficient because you might not need all the information on upfront. Yeah, so that's the, what Eric said, is you can actually hide a schema or show a schema, so it's completely up to you. You don't have to show all the databases or all the tables that you have inside. Okay, any more questions? All right, uh, question. of course. So how does like, the cursor is at the same position when the node is modified? How does a cursor? Yeah, it's at the same position, like even the node is uh, modified. Uh, the cursor will be on the same position. Yeah, so given the context, if you had a connection which displays this ordered set of articles, the cursors will be tailored to that connection. So if you ever provide that connection again and you give the cursor back, it will give you, sorry, the exact same node. So even the node has to modify? 
if the node has been modified, the node will change inside the cursor. So if we, as, as seen before, we queried all the articles and the articles was wrapped in the edge and then edge had a cursor and a node which showed the article. And if we change the article, it doesn't have anything to do with the edge itself. It just points to this node inside the data graph of GraphQL. So it's just a link. It's, it's not an actual uh, field. All right, more questions? Super. All right now, so how can we make data-driven views using GraphQL? The interesting thing is that we actually form GraphQL and request only the data where we need, but this is spe specifically tailored for actually making a view. So let's dig deeper. What are the concerns that require tackling in making a powerful front-end data-driven view? So first of all, we want to fetch all the data for the view. You have all of your nested components or parts of it, or you have uh, forms which also need to mirror the, some edge or some edge. You basically can, with GraphQL, define that view and get exactly what you need. You also need to decide when and how to fetch that. You also, front, on the front end side, you need to manage errors, you need to retry failed requests. Of course, you need to update local cache. So if you have a store which holds all the information that you've been pulling, you also need to update that to reflect all the queries that you made after. And ideally, you would make optimistic updates to the UI. Do you know what optimistic updates are? Basically, optimistic updates allow you to modify and interact with the user before the server actually responded. So if you made an update to an article and you changed its title, you can make an opti optimistic UI update reflecting the change immediately. But in a case that that change or mutation has failed, you would want to revert all the changes up to that point, to point to the actual, to the last title that was correct. So let's go step by step in building this data-driven view using GraphQL. So I will start off with this very important building block, and you'll see why later on. Caching GraphQL. Since we already defined that all, article, all nodes inside a GraphQL uh, schema are globally identifiable, you can basically make a record, which is this cache here, which maps uh, nodes to its global IDs, like in this case here. If I queried all the articles, and then I got article one, article two, and then I also got a user, which is basically a link within an article, we want to flatten that out in order to have a more performant cache. So normalizing this response from, uh, from GraphQL would be your first step. We can normalize it into a flat list. Why? Because we have globally unique identifiables. Even if the link, if you want to point to a link, the link itself is also uniquely identifiable because you can see uh, which node you're pointing and then point that node with a unique ID for the link itself. So here we see the standard cache, which we would implement, and the cache consists of records which basically map uh, for, uh, field names to values and it can also link to other records. So treat this article object as a record and it has an author which links to this user down below. Why is this nice? Why is this really powerful and helps you have a more consistent view? Anyone? Excuse me? It makes updating simpler. It makes updating very simple. If, for example, I had an article, I have two articles in this case, which point to the exact same user. If I would have a nested cache, I would need to find every single article and then map it and see if it points to a user and then modify that user. If I have a flat list in this case, if I ever modify this user, since the articles are just links, the complete UI would have always the latest data inside. 
So every record is efficiently stored only once, regardless of how many times you fetch it or how deeply nested was it inside of a GraphQL query. So let's see how we can write new queries to the cache. So given that I was on a list of all the articles, and then I opened an article, and that article changed in the meantime. I'm performing this query where I want the article with this unique ID. And I know that the title and the email of the user, uh, the title was changed, but the email field was added. This is how the cache would reflect that change. The title would be immediately modified, as well as all the comments would be flattened out, and the email would be added to the user record. So if any field or any view pointed to these cache locations, it would be immediately updated with the latest correct data. So to recap, if you have a query of all the articles, and then in the meantime, after you requested all the articles, a single article has changed, but you opened it, if you went back, the same article in the list would also be updated without making another network request. So this is why efficient caching is really good to, to, to is, is, works really well together with GraphQL. Since I said before, new mutations are also treated as queries with the power to modify data. If I make an update to the title of a certain article, I can treat it and normalize it through the same caching logic and basically get the new cache updated with the new fields without ever touching the actual cache itself. So I have this cache now and I want to actually make use of it. I need to wrap it in a store. So this store would actually provide an API for which I can interact with the cache. By the cache, I mean as a source of data. So here the store is a source of truth. Uh, the source is the source of truth for the store. It contains all the data that you have ever fetched, all the mutations that you did, and it efficiently stores them inside a flattened map. We can also have multiple APIs with that, like a lookup where you can provide a selector and then it takes a part from the source and gives you back the value. You can of course subscribe to a single record or a field or a name and basically with doing so, every change that happened on that record should be reflected against the subscriber. You can also publish and notify changes. Publish does an update to the source, so it merges if you have a new query and you provide that query inside this publish function, it would merge the, cons the existing cache with the new query and it will also do updates within. And then you have notify and not what notify does is it notifies all the subscribers against the publishers that you've made before. Why did we split publish and notify? It's for a very simple reason, so that you can apply multi multiple changes within the cache, but have only one UI update, which is, as we all know, more difficult, more intensive, more performance intensive. So let's actually use that store that we've just built and make a view. So this is just pseudocode, and let's say that I subscribed in the store to an article with this unique ID, and then I make a view out of it. A view is just a simple component which gets that article and displays relevant data about it. We can also make changes and make a form request which will change the local store just by publishing the next article and notifying all the relevant subscribers, including itself. So this form would also have its default values changed. So caching is nice, but we want a data from a remote endpoint. We don't want only to communicate with the local cache. We need a way to fill it and keeping view in mind, we need better means of selecting and fetching data. So queries now in this here becomes a fetcher. Since it's a fetcher, it can hold request specific data like if it bugged out with this error object, a retry function with this retry, and actual data that you are requesting. So with this simple logic in mind, if you have an error inside, display an error box which will, uh, which will offer a retry option. 
if you, have, if you don't have any articles, it means that the data is still loading. And then finally, if the article is in place, you can display the view. On the right hand side, you see the actual query on GraphQL, which can represent this view. We, can, uh, we need, often with front end, we think about making components reusable and partitioning parts of the view, meaning that if I have an article and I have a user component within, I don't want to always redundantly write the complete user component. I want to abstract that level away and reuse it. So if we have the exact same view as before, and we perform this query, and then we have parts on the right hand side, we want to connect those parts and display proper comments. You can see here that inside the comment component, we are again reusing the author component, and uh, this way we are basically writing components only once. This is how you would represent that exact same view with GraphQL. So if you would want to request an article and you want to partition the author, you would just make a fragment against that author. And if you want to partition it even more, you can make a fragment on the comment and, uh, uh, and specify exactly the needs that you need for a specific view. So performing mutations, you've seen before that we can update the local cache, but if, you rem if we remember, once the cache is updated, we automatically merge it with the new cache. Once the cache is updated, we automatically merge it with the new mutation, and immediately it should reflect all the changes throughout the app. So it would be sufficient within a form just to perform a mutation, and then that mutation, since it is also a query, can uh, change other data given its request. So consider considering everything that we've talked about, I present to you Relay Modern. So Relay Modern is a JavaScript framework for building data-driven React, uh, uh, data React applications. It's developed in-house by Facebook, the same guys who have developed React. They are using it to power their own uh, front end, so Facebook is powered by uh, Relay, Relay Modern. It allows you to declare data for gra with GraphQL, and then Relay abstracts all the other things away and determines how, when to fetch that data. You can write GraphQL mutations, and, graph and Relay would automatically ensure cache consistency, optimistic updates and error handling. So showing proper errors, retrying queries, and all of that. And it also comes with a compiler which offers ahead of time code generation. We'll talk about that here. So what the Relay compiler does is it generates uh, ahead of time definitions for your flow or TypeScript enabled application. Since we, talked about, uh, since we talked before about the schema against which you can define all the possible fields and define what types of fields they are, why not make your front end also type safe? Because you already have all the, uh, all the types inside a GraphQL schema. What it also does is it makes runtime representations of your query and mutations. How it does so is it goes through your complete code base and finds everywhere where you have been referencing a GraphQL endpoint, and it can extract that data and make really powerful and optimized GraphQL requests for the runtime itself. You can also use that data as security, where you can have it as only legal, option, only legal queries that you can make against a specific GraphQL endpoint. So, if I run a, a, the compiler against my front-end app and I got all the uh, queries that could possibly be run, I can use this exact same data set and protect my API endpoint by saying only these requests are allowed. The second part of Relay Modern is the runtime. What it does is it provides a normalized in-memory object cache. So those are the records and the cache that we've talked before. It optimizes write optim op operations, meaning that it mutates data, it doesn't create new data, it publishes and uh, notifies all the subscribers. It has a really nice uh, garbage collection. It's designed for being really high performance, 
and it's capable of scaling to huge and complex apps. Of course, uh, mutations with optimistic updates are available. So what it does is it actually, uh, once you make a mutation, you can say, okay, this is an uh, optimistic response that I would get, and then Relay would immediately update throughout its complete store all the changes that you've reflected. Okay, so this is the runtime architecture of Relay Modern. We'll start from bottom up. So we have this data ID. This is the source, uh, this is the source of getting records within a record source. It's globally unique, so you can have this data ID point to any location inside your cache. Then we have records, which use these data IDs, data IDs as identifiers. The records basically hold the fields, the values, and it uh, can also link to other records. It also has a record source, which is essentially the cache, the thing that we talked about before. And this record source is like the source of truth for the store itself. What the record source holds is just a proper implementation of caching your GraphQL uh, requests. And you have your store. This store is the one that you are communicating with when you are using Relay Runtime. And it does the publishes, the notifications, and subscriptions, and all of that. And then you have your network, which is the next layer which you use to communicate with a remote endpoint. And when we encapsulate all of that, we basically get a really modern environment. This environment is reusable, so whenever you pass the environment, you just make proper connections and proper requests. And you can have multiple environments, of course. If you have multiple GraphQL endpoints to which you want to communicate, you just build a different set or multiple set of environments, and then you use it. This is a code which shows us the least uh, amount of code that we need to write to set up the environment for Relay Modern. So on the top, we see that we create a record source then we put that record source inside the store. Then we also make a specific network uh, request which is optimized to fetch GraphQL queries. So see here, we are providing the operation and the variables and I'm just using that operation text and the variables inside to make another request. So inside this same fetch function, you could uh, put your authentication token or add subscriptions or whatever you want. And then you combine the network with the store and you get the environment. So the next building block for Relay Modern is Query Renderer. And this query renderer does exactly the thing that we talked about. It allows you to collocate your GraphQL requests and let them live inside the component so that you uh, never need to navigate away to see which data you are getting from. So with the query renderer, we provide it with an environment which tells us to which network it should communicate as well as which store. Then you perform a query saying, I want this article with this data. Then you pass in the variables for that article, and then you just render it. If there is an error, display an error component. If the uh, data is still not available, display a spinner. Otherwise, display the proper view. Then we have a fragment container. What a fragment container does is it allows you to split components into multiple parts and just define a fragment for some uh, component. This allows us to build dumb components which just take in a fragment of article with these fields and they just handle that. They don't need to, they don't worry about how and the means of getting that data. So combining these two here, we see that we spread the fragment that we created against an article and we do the exact same thing in the end, but we display the article view. You can, of course, nest multiple uh, fragment containers. So you can have your article fragment container, which also has an author, which uses a different component for displaying that author. So combining this with the compiler, you bring, you, the compiler can build up a complete query, which can then be run against a GraphQL endpoint and give you back exactly what you need. It can also, along the way, optimize and perform specific actions for a better feel. 
there are two more components, containers, which really modern offers. We have a refetch container and a pagination container. They're both like regular fragment containers, but the refetch container, for example, provides ability to fetch a new query with different variables and re-render the same component. This is useful if you are performing search actions, for example. You have a fragment which displays all the users, and once you do uh, input inside a text element, it would call this refetch container and refetch everything, before, everything again. And then we have our pagination uh, container, and the only thing is it does is it's designed to simplify the flow of making a paginated view. It tells you if there are more values inside the view, inside the connection. It tells you, uh, it tells you if there's an error, if it's loading or not, and allows you to add more or to request more inside that. So here is a basic mutation that you would perform with Relay Modern with an optimistic update, so I will go through this. The mutation does an update on an article where, where it matches this input with the data from the second thing. And then using the commit mutation, we pass in the mutation that we want to perform. We pass in the variables, what article, with what data. And then we can also provide an optimistic response. Given a GraphQL query here, we know that we will get uh, data, that we will get this update article with ID, title, and content back. So we can actually use the variables that we are passing to this mutation immediately and make those changes immediate. In a case that this mutation didn't, uh, didn't succeed, it was failed or bugged out, it would actually revert this optimistic response and you would be back. At, uh, at the last correct result set. And then you have your on-complete and on-error helpers, which just tell you if the uh, mutation was successful or not. So let's go through our example lab. First, what we need to do is we need to start up the Relay compiler here. And here I would just start a normal development environment. Let me show you what the front end looks like. So when I run dev relay, I just run the compiler against a source. I define that the language which I want to use is TypeScript. I define where do I want to store the artifacts that it's generated and the schema for the, for the endpoint. I also pass the watch flag, which just tells you to listen for changes on inside our code base. Let's just take a look at our schema. So this is a schema from that, uh, from that Prisma GraphQL endpoint that we've created. There we passed a model of data that it should hold, but it actually gives you a lot of more in-depth uh, queries which you can run to empower that endpoint. So we also have here an environment, sorry, which is exactly what I've showed you before. It has a record source, it has a store, it then makes a fetch, which is optimized in performing GraphQL requests. We then have a JSON response, and we combine that inside an environment, and we export that by default. If I take a look at the articles page, which is this page here, still building, or, yep, which is this page here, you can see that we have a list of all the articles. We can create one. Okay, so this is the user, and we just give title example, and we have content, and we have added that article right away. If I open the article, I can perform, I can delete it, or I can change it. Let's see how the title change works in the back. So as you can see, I point to the title of the article here and here. So this is, uh, this points to the article field of title. And if I change it, 
you see that it immediately reflects all other instances, even here, of the uh, affected record. So how do I do that? How do I actually update the article? Let's open the GraphQL mutation. And this is it. As seen before, I run an update article mutation. I pass in what data I want to apply and at which article. And then I just define the optimistic response, which will show that change immediately and really abstracts everything else away. Imagine if you had to build this using Redux, using optimistic updates. You would need to store data inside the Redux store. You would, make, you would need to make dispatchers and actions, which will get the queries, update the queries, and then you need to provide consistency and much, much more work than just using Relay, which has this implemented out in, inside of a box. We can also see that if I perform a request, and I will block it now. So if I block a request, and then I perform an update, I change the title from Relay Modern to Relay Modder. You see here that I'm blocking the request, but the changes are made. So this is what the optimistic response does. And if I decide to completely error out the change, it will actually revert back to the previous values that there were before. Also, if you try and change a specific article, so let's write a mutation elsewhere, which will up update an article where the ID is this one and it will, set, it will set the title to something else and give us back the new title. Let's take a look at how that would look like inside the network request area. So we have networks and it's a completely, no networks are actively being made. And this is the affected article that's going to be changed. Now, if I change the article and change the title, of course, the title still didn't change. But just by opening the article, I'm making, uh, sorry, was it this one? Or, where are these? Yeah. No, it was a wrong article. Okay, so let's go back. Let's clean this up. So I'm not making any requests, and I have performed a change against this article. And then just by opening it, here I see the new title. And this new title, of course, I got it because I made a request for the article itself. But if I go back, let's just close this. If I go back, keep in mind that there is only one query. If I go back, the article title changed here too but I just made one single request. And this is what the power of the cache from Relay does. It basically takes the last successful query to being the original and the most accurate data source. So just by refetching parts of lists or opening a list item, you would change throughout the complete app with the latest information. So this is a small example of Relay Modern. This will be also available as a Relay Modern boilerplate, and you you can you could access it. Uh, I don't have a link now, but I will notify someone so that you can. I'll just post it on the media page. What this boilerplate will actually use? It will use TypeScript, and it will show you how you can just get it started real quick with least amount of code. The boilerplate consists only the parts that are completely crucial to actually using Relay Modern. So we are hiring, and if, uh, if there are guys who are interested in working with us in developing the future of uh, accounting, please come to talk to me or to Eric. And thank you for listening. Are there any questions before the clap? First one ever. Right? First one ever, yeah.
Good job. Good job. Thank you, guys. I'm glad. Good questions. Uh, can you provide some comparison to uh, Apollo? Comparison to Apollo? Can you compare uh, relay to Apollo? Uh, I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm not very familiar with Apollo, but from what I've seen, it uh, it still has you to abstract the storage for Apollo, and you need to define the store for it and do changes. I'm not certain, but that's from what I've read, and really completely moves that away from you. I can show you also how this store looks like. So let's open the console, and. I'll just take the environment and take the record source. So I'll just log it out. Keep in mind that I created it just by defining this new class. And here is the record source inside our Relay Modern app. And it exactly mirrors the unique data ID against a specific record. So you can see here that we have users which has this unique ID of type this, and it's only listed once. If an article points, let's just find an article. I can't find it, Here one. here's one. It points, it references the author to another record inside this map, and this, it does this automatically. So given you created a fragment container or a query renderer or just fetched a normal query through Relay, it would actually repopulate this in-memory cache and it will handle all the garbage collection and everything and of course update your front end and all the components which are affected by the change. Yeah. How does? How does deal with deletion? Like deletion. Delete yes. So let me show you a delete mutation. Delete article mutation. And what this does is it just deletes a mutation. And from the store, from the store perspective, you can just pinpoint a node and completely remove it. So you can just say delete and pass in the unique identifier, and it will remove the node without making a single request. I, I can show you that here. So it also has this optimistic response uh, applied inside, let's say, add article mutation. If I, for example, block a request, as I would do now, I'll start blocking requests, and I create, and I create a new article which has new as its name and content as its content, I'm blocking the request. You can see that I am still blocking it. But here, it's, I can't remember what name I put. <laughs> okay, the date. Create article. Yeah, so it didn't work. Didn't work, but uh, let's let's just open the ad article. Anyway, if, if I create, uh, like, of course, everywhere, it deletes it everywhere. If you have a relationship, the relationship will not, will be nullified. Okay. So if you have, let's say, an article which points to a user which is later on deleted, the user ID, the user field would just be nulled, but the user itself would be completely removed through from the record source. The same thing goes for adding and for updating. Same, same. All the nodes inside the edge. Well, that means if, you have, if I'm removing one item, basically the, the thing before, then you, you move the cursor to the thing after. Does it all do that by default? Yes. Okay. Yes, it does. So if you remove something, you can remove it from the edge itself, yeah. meaning that if the edge is affected, it's regardless how deeply nested or if that article connection or whatever is deep, it's still modified because it's flattened out to this flat uh, map cache. What if I have, um, like for, for example, with Apollo, like managing the, the cache, I know, or like from experience, it's hard if you have custom query arguments. Right. Let's say you order, you filter by title, exactly. uh, X, Y, and then the order yeah. is by creator. So what? It, it does beautifully. I'll show you its create article mutation. So this is what I use 
in creating an article. Do you see? Do you see the text? Can I? Can I just like do some other light theme? Yeah, this is better, right? Okay, so here I'm performing a create article mutation, and I want to create this article and add it. Let's just drop this and add it right away here in this view. For me to do that, I of course need to provide the information about it. I put the mutation inside here, and then I provide an optimistic response of what it should do. Yeah. And then I basically connect it with the updater, which tells me, get me this article's connection, which is identified, yeah. which is identified like this. And this connection lives here in the article's list. And all the way on the bottom, on the fragment, you see that I define a connection which shouldn't be filtered out. What's the best way to move away? So using this connection metadata field, you provide a key for this connection. And then Relay automatically knows, OK, this is a connection. It has edges. It has page information. It has counters. It has all of the other stuff that you need to worry about. And here, you just need to provide the parent of that uh, connection. In this case, the parent is nothing, so it's just the client root. And then you provide the key for that connection. And given those two things, you just do insert edge before or after, and then it puts it on the top or on the bottom of the connection. You, like, let's say I, <coughs> I have an existing search, which is uh, that's that's that, that's my next point. So uh, here, as as a not, as more options, you can provide filters which you define here. So let's say I also have here a filter, like search text, which takes a string and does whatever. You can say and define this search text as being a part of a filter. So when you are retrieving a connection, you also need to specify what filter it has applied. So if, as you said, you have a connection which is already searched or narrowed down, and the new edge doesn't fit that connection, it wouldn't find it. And then it wouldn't add it. Otherwise, if it does fit, it just looks through these filters and finds it accordingly. So you can also. Uh, this removes a lot of that you have in the photo, You don't have to pass the filters in. So you can just pass in the most relevant filters. Like the search text is not that relevant, but the type of the node might be. So if you are showing articles which are published or not, then it makes a difference if you could add it. Here you can decide what are the filters for a specific connection. And we use, I use Relay Modern with Damanda, and I'm completely rewriting the front end from Redux to Relay Modern. And I never wrote a single request to the store. The store is completely managed. I just open up queries. I open up or edit or do uh, optimistic updates and response. And it just works beautifully. With, together with its like articles page, together with this query renderer, which already provides with an error or provides you with a retry function, you can just pass in those two inside the error component which does just this. It displays an error message and shows a button which will trigger the retry which you pass in. So immediately, if you are having problems loading this network here, so let's just block it real quick. Request blocking. Let's add, nah, just, let's add, what's this? Articles page query and block it. And then I try requesting it. It's, it's failed in fetching. You can't fetch it. But you have this button which retries the, uh, the request. And then when it comes available, oh no, I enabled the wrong one. When it comes available, it just works again. And this is like beautifully. Always with Redux, I always had for a single connection or a list, I had more parameters which would say articles error, articles loading, and then articles itself. And then I would check if the error exists, and then I would call an action, which would call a reducer, which would remove the error, and retry the action again, and repopulate those two fields. But 
I've, I've been always doing exactly this. If there is an error, show it on retry, call this action. And here, what, uh, what really Modern does is it provides you that information right there on the spot. So you are, I, you are just left with the view. From my, ex from my experience and perspective, I've been just writing views. And I write correct fragments, and together with the relay compiler, I get all the artifacts and the typings. So I will show you how, for example, the article's page query is typed. So we have, uh, it, it consists only of, let's just take a look at the article, for example. Are you all familiar with TypeScript? Have you used it before? Yeah, so given, given an article page, which is this one here, let me show you what. So this is the affected article. I here have just constructed a fragment of the file name and the prop on which I'm passing the fragment here inside the article. And then the compiler actually builds the artifact itself. And it says, OK, this is the type. It has read-only fields. It has a string. It's required. It can't be nulled. You also have all the other information that's required for making an efficient GraphQL request. If you have enums or you have unique fields, everything will be also put inside this artifact so you have your type safety. Aside from having it at GraphQL, you have it within your app too. More questions? Please. Uh, I've been using uh, Relay Classic, mm -hmm. but the problem for me was that you never had the chance for a local cache or store. Okay. I think they changed that in Relay Modern, but, but do you think it's, it's like still worth going back from an evolved application to? Okay, okay. So uh, I, I, I didn't use Relay classic. So I know that you can modify and populate the store however you want. You don't have to make any GraphQL queries. How I used it and how I interacted with the store, since my API doesn't provide GraphQL native subscriptions, I still want to get live data. And then I subscribe to a specific WebSocket which provides me with that data. And then I just mutate it using the store of Relay. How do I do that? I just search by the ID and populate the fields. And it's literally 10 lines of code with the WebSocket connection. Through the connection, I pass in an object with the type and the unique ID, of course, with the fields. And throughout the complete store, you would always get the latest data about it. So given those interactions, I think that you can build a cache from scratch and just use it that way. Please. Um, let's say you have a GraphQL backend that doesn't follow this uh, cursor-based design because the backend team still uses pagination. Yeah. Um, can you use Relay Modern? Or you can use a hard requirement? the only requirement for Relay Modern is that the IDs are globally unique. Okay. Uh, on the site, it says differently because they need you to use their specification because then you get the best experience. But if you don't have the connections, you can just use a refetch container and paginate it yourself. Okay, but they, if I want to use the connections, I need to have this cursor-based API. If you want to use the pagination container, and yeah. that's the only thing. Here, inside that's an optimist, come from. Come that's from where? One. That's where the good magic. That's exactly it. So given the optimistic response, you can also mutate data with, without edges or without nodes or without, not nodes, without cursors and without connections. So it's straightforward, it's just not well documented <laughs> inside Relay. And you can do, it's completely, uh, it's, it doesn't care what the endpoint is, you can just use it. Just anything, you can just construct a quick one here, like a test, and then use it within, and you will still get the store and the re flattened record cache and all of that with live updates, but you don't have like connections or whatever. So you can progressively, for example, go to a really modern server where you just have a plain GraphQL and you start using it and then you are moving more to a more real uh, relay server. Please. Uh, 
Is there a requirement that the global ID is globally unique? This is a requirement that we need it's, to it's server-side. Yeah. It could also be done on the network layer. It can, of course. So it's n you don't, as I said, it just abstracts over a data storage. For example, I use PostGraph file, which takes a Postgres database and builds a GraphQL schema out of it. And inside the Postgres database, we use uh, UUIDs as identifiers, but there are tables which have two primary keys or three or don't have a key at all. The only requirement is that uh, the, the PostGraph file actually takes that information and allows you to give in an argument and say, I will make globally unique IDs for you for a really compliant environment. Just so you. On the back end, we use UUIDs, but they don't have to be unique on the database side. Yeah. They just need to be unique on the network layer. Ah, you can. Okay, okay. I get with you. Right, right. Right, right. I get what you're saying. It it doesn't provide that. In configuration, so what what lands in the cache actor are unique IDs. Okay. Yes. Yes. So so with really modern, the only thing that you can do is modify this fetcher here and have some action performed which will globalize a unique ID. But it's a requirement that it's named ID and that it's global against the store because if you, sorry, if you would send an existing ID, it would just crash and bug out. You could, in theory, do it here. That's how I would do it if I had to approach it that way. Exactly, so that's, that's what PostGraph file does, is basically if I have, for example, a database which is called, I don't know, articles, and I have this UUID here. What PostGraph file does is it takes a tuple from these two and then just converts it to a base64, and then you get this unique ID. And once you pass this, you know what table against uh, which ID, and you basically have a globally unique ID. And th this is how it do does it. Please. Like, uh, like cache the queries or yeah, yeah. yeah. It, it's basically you yeah cache the queries and take a, okay. then you have a unique identifier for a query which replaces the actual query. So relay modern caching, it also does that. I just probably couldn't find it from the top of my mind, but it provides you with an API two for caching queries and mutations. So you can have, for example, your app run for a while, open up some articles or some pages or whatever, and all those queries could be cached. And then if you... Oh, okay, okay. But we, we can discuss it later. Okay, okay. Then I didn't get your question. Server side? No, no. We don't do that, like, at all. <laughs> 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 yeah, that, that's for later, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, then I would say let's conclude it. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening.